my name is John Panofino. I'm the president of the American Neurogastroenterology and Motility Society. And I'm welcoming you here tonight for our virtual webinar. And soon I'll introduce uh, Jason Baker, who will introduce uh, Bill Hassler and Lydia Watts, who will be uh, helping out with the virtual webinar and speaking this evening. A couple of quick announcements. Just want to make sure everybody knows uh, we had a very successful ANMS in Philadelphia. Congratulations um, to the team and the chairs that put that meeting together it was really exceptional. Um, we're looking forward to um, going to Austin, Texas in August, um, August 11th to 13th. So mark that out on your calendar, please. Um, in terms of uh, other business you saw, remember that the deadlines for the ANMS grant opportunities are coming up on October 14th, both the discovery grants and the transition grants. So please make sure that those applications are in. And then also consider the ANMS basic science mini sabbatical program that's also become uh, something that I think will be very popular in the future. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring in um, Jason Baker. And uh, for those of you who don't know Jason, I, I don't think that's many. Jason is really a, a pioneer um, in terms of what he's uh, done um, for our society and for the field. Jason has really uh, made it a priority um, for standardization and quality of the performance of the protocol, because we, as we all know, um, garbage in, garbage out. And, and Jason has been really at the forefront of that and pushing all of us to just do a better job when we're actually doing these diagnostic tests. So I've introduced Jason multiple times over the years, and I'm not gonna belabor it too much, but I'm gonna hand the uh, podium over to him and have him introduce our, our participants tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Panerfina. Too kind, too kind. Um, I'm, it's very blessed to have as my co-moderator tonight, um, mentor, dear friend, um, really a legend in neurogastroenterology. And um, his name is Dr. William Hassler. He's uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. He's an Amherst professor in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at University of Michigan. He has a long-standing interest in clinical care and investigation of conditions with nausea and vomiting, including gastroparesis. He has more than 200 publications, including authorship and several consensus documents on GI motility disorders, such as those published by the Rome Foundation and NMS. He has been previously funded by the NIH to study gastroparesis, has served as an editor, associate editor of gastroenterology, and has mentored several GI fellows and junior faculty at both institutions. Um, really blessed to have Dr. Hassler with us tonight. Um, the speaker tonight um, is Lydia Watts. Um, she graduated from Western, Mich Western Michigan University with a Bachelor's of Arts and uh, a Bachelor's of Science. She started as a GI physiology technologist at the, uh, Michigan Medicine in January of 2018. Within one year, she became the lead technologist in the lab and has been the supervisor of all Michigan Medicine GI physiology labs since April 2020. During her time at Michigan Medicine, she has grown the EndoFlip program to serve pediatric and adult patients in the endo suites and operating rooms. In addition to performing these procedures, she's also worked with her physician colleagues in research, um, research studies focusing on EndoFlip in the pylorus. She's been able to present these findings around the world, including conferences in Lisbon and um, Australia. And she's really been the key person um, driving the EndoFlip program at Michigan for about five years. Um, and before Lydia starts the presentation, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Uh, if you could put your questions in the Q&A um, app on the bottom and not the chat box, we appreciate that. And Dr. Hassan and I will toggle back and forth at the end to ask um, uh, Lydia questions. And also, uh, this is very pertinent to be talking about gastroparesis being uh, Gastroparesis Awareness Month. So um, looking forward to this presentation. Over to you, Lydia. Thank you, uh, Dr. Baker, Dr. Hassler, Dr. Pandolfino, and to ANMS for having me here uh, to talk about gastroparesis. Let me share my screen here. Um, let's see. Oops. Perfect. All right. So, um, like Dr. Baker said, I've been a tech for about five years at Michigan Medicine, uh, seeing some pretty high acuity patients. So um, I'm glad to be 
talking to a lot of my allied health professionals and even some physician colleagues uh, just about how we can, um, just some tips and tricks um, about all of the tests we do to help our patients with gastroparesis. Um, so first I'll talk about what is gastroparesis. Um, it's the delayed passage of food through the stomach. It's diagnosed by a gastric emptying scintigraphy or a gastric emptying scan. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know, it's uh, where patients will eat the radio labeled meal with um, eggs and toast. They're monitored for about four hours. Um, and they scan at each hour, but we use the four hour mark to determine whether or not they have gastroparesis. And we define that as more than 10% retention of solid food after four hours. There's three main types of gastroparesis. Um, diabetic, which as the name suggests are um, patients with diabetes. Post-surgical, which happens after um, an upper abdominal surgi surgery typically that could have caused uh, damage to the vagus nerve. And if you don't fall into those two groups, we think you have idiopathic gastroparesis, which is where we're not quite sure of the mechanism that led to the disease. Led to the disease. Um, some of the symptoms of gastroparesis are vomiting, nausea, fullness, abdominal bloating, and abdominal pain. Um, these symptoms can be quite debilitating and can lead to a significant decline in a patient's quality of life. Um, we use the PAGI SIM and the PAGI QUAL questionnaires to determine uh, the severity of the system, uh, the symptoms, and how much gastroparesis has affected their quality of life. Um, as allied health professionals, we do um, additional testing um, at University of Michigan. It's in the GI physiology lab. Um, we do additional testing uh, for these patients. Uh, the first test I will talk about is hydrogen breath testing for SIBO. Some symptoms associated with gastroparesis are also associated with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, especially bloating. Um, the wireless motility capsule or smart pill is especially, especially useful in patients with an egg allergy that cannot undergo gastric scintigraphy. Unfortunately, there's, we still don't have a standardized meal um, that doesn't include an egg. So we see a lot of patients uh, for smart pill that have egg allergy. It's also used in patients that um, we may suspect a whole gut dysmotility since it looks at the stomach, the small bowel and the colon we can get a good look at the entire digestive tract as opposed to just the stomach. Um, we also do antroduodenal manometry. This is an invasive test that measures contractions of the stomach and the duodenum to see if there may be some sort of neuropathy or nerve damage or myopathy um, or muscle damage in the gut. And finally, we also do endoflip. Endoflip is a balloon test that's performed during endoscopy that can measure if the pylorus is too tight or not stretchy uh, in patients with gastroparesis. So first I will talk about hydrogen breath testing. Um, patients will drink either a 75 gram dextrose solution or our diabetic patients will drink a 10 gram lactulose solution. If anyone on the webinar has ever had to do a glucose tolerance test to look for gestational diabetes, um, it's that same really, really sweet sugary drink. Um, so they'll drink that and breath samples will be taken every 15 minutes for about two hours. Throughout that two hours, we will also uh, record what symptoms they're feeling. So any bloating, nausea, things like that. Um, we really pay close attention to documenting how they're feeling throughout the test. Um, with each breath sample, we will measure hydrogen and methane concentration. Um, a positive test for SIBO uh, shows a more than 12 parts per million jump of hydrogen in a glucose test or a more than 20 parts per million increase in hydrogen in the lactulose test and 
or uh, both sugars show a more than 10 parts per million increase in methane. Um, so basically, when you drink all that sugar, the bacteria in your gut will digest it and ferment off those gases. Anything over the um, anything over that 12 or 20 or 10 parts per million shows that there's just way too much bacteria in there causing those symptoms. Um, the results can help the clinician decide if they want to maybe try a round of antibiotics to treat the SIBO, and that may also help with those gastroparesis symptoms. Um, moving on to smart pill, um, the patient presents to the GI physiology lab to swallow the smart pill capsule <clears throat> and receive their instructions. The rest of the test uh, takes course over the next seven days while the patient is just going about their normal daily activities. The smart pill records pH, temperature, and pressure data over the course of that seven days. If the pill is passed in a bowel movement, um, the test can end sooner. However, in patients, since we suspect dysmotility in these patients, we very infrequently see that this test ends sooner than seven days. Um, ideally, to get the most accurate tests, we prefer that patients withhold stomach stimulants like metoclopramide, laxatives, acid-reducing medications, and narcotics if possible. Um, so on the right here, we see an example of a smart pill tracing. So those three parameters I mentioned, pH, temperature, and pressure, those are what the clinician will use to determine where the pill is at in, um, <clears throat> in the patient. For example, to the left here, this green line represents pH. Um, we can see that the pH is really low. That's a sign that the pill is in the stomach. Once it moves, um, once we see a higher pH, that's a sign that it can move out of the stomach. So the clinician will use those three parameters to determine gastric emptying time, small bowel transit time, colonic transit time, and whole gut transit time. There are some barriers to performing smart pill. The biggest one that I have run into is insurance coverage. It's still considered investigational by some insurance companies. So unfortunately, um, that's one of the biggest barriers we see. It's tough to get this procedure covered. Um, the next one is pill dysphagia or trouble swallowing pills. Um, as you can see here on the right, the, the pill is quite large. It's more than an inch long and a half inch wide with an irregular shape. The top part is a rubber uh, coating and the bottom part is plastic. So um, even patients that don't typically report trouble swallowing pills can have a difficult time with this one. Um, and finally, it may be difficult for patients to stop the uh, stomach stimulants, laxatives and pain medications. Um, and what we do is we just have to take that on a case by case basis. Uh, the information that we get from smart pill is incredibly important. And, um, you know, we're asking patients, you know, if we ask them to stop a laxative, that could mean they're not having a bowel movement for 10 days, which can be extremely uncomfortable. So working with the clinician and the patient to come up with a plan to get this procedure done. Um, is extremely important because stopping these medications can be extremely difficult for patients and sometimes not an option. So uh, the next test I'll talk about is an antroduodenal manometry. Um, the toughest part of the antroduodenal manometry is catheter placement, um, which happens while the patient is asleep. Um, they'll wake up in recovery and that's when they will uh, finish the manometric testing, which is about nine hours. Um, we do a six hour baseline reading, which is where the, we encourage the patient to try and take a nap as best as they can. You know, you can see in the picture on the right, they have a catheter in their throat. So sometimes it's difficult to um, sleep, but it's incredibly important during this, during, uh, this part of the testing 
that the patient remain as still as possible to avoid getting any type of artifact. Um, after that baseline, we do a two hour meal challenge. The meal challenge consists of uh, hopefully around 400 calories of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, if possible. Again, they have a catheter in their throat. It's pretty difficult for the patient to eat. So working with them and encouraging them to try and get as much food down as possible is very important. Um, and if you know all it is, if all they can get down is pudding, then that's okay. We work with what we can get. Um, after the meal challenge, we do a one hour medication challenge. Historically, we have done either erythromycin or octreotide. Um, what medication we use is based on what our physician sees during the baseline recording. Um, after we do the manometric testing, we remove the catheter and the patient is discharged. We don't require any type of monitoring after the procedure typically. Um, the information that we get from the antiduodenal manometry can help the clinician determine if you, the patient should try other stimulants, um, tube feedings into the intestine or TPN. This is a photo of our antiduodenal manometry, antiduodenal manometry catheters. There's, uh, we use custom catheters, um, but there's over here, this one is the one with the weighted tip. Um, this is only used during endoscopy. And I'll show on the next slide some tips and tricks that we use to help with placement. Um, on the right, we have a wire-guided catheter. Um, one of our physicians was trained that way and prefers the wire-guided, which, which he uses during endoscopy with the help of fluoro. Um, so for placement, you can see here that I've tied four different sutures on. Um, this helps not only with placement, but also knowing where to position the catheter. So the first two, um, the one by the weighted tip uh, and the one about 10 centimeters above the weighted tip, those are solely for placement. Uh, the endoscopist can grab onto the suture and drag it into the duodenum um, as pretty much as far as he is able to, because he'll lose a little bit or they will lose a little bit as they pull the scope out. Um, the one located at 18 centimeters, it's hard to tell from the photo, but um, it's purple. So we like to try and keep it purple for pylorus. Um, that is located at 18 centimeters. And so that tells us that there's about 18 centimeters or measurement channels in the duodenum, which leaves us with about six measurement channels in the antrum. So keeping that purple suture as close to the pylorus as possible is going to give us a high quality tracing that includes both the antrum and the duodenum. Um, and finally, regardless of whether you're um, using a weighted tip or a wire guided catheter. Um, with the weighted tip, you still want to use a guide wire because it will keep the catheter stiffer. Um, if the catheter is like a little more on the floppy side, it makes it a little harder to place. Um, so there are also some barriers with barriers with interduodenal manometry. Um, I would say the, uh, one of the bigger ones is patient tolerance. Um, it's a nine hour procedure and it's a pretty thick tube that is sitting in their throat. Um, and they're not able to get up and move around or get their mind off of it really. So, um, the, it's really important that the allied health professional really in, uh, encourage and um, kind of cheer the patient on to get through this procedure so that the, their physician can get this important information. Um, we can also have difficult catheter placements just because of the patient's anatomy. You know, if they have a J-shaped stomach, 
the catheter is going to fall out a lot easier. Um, so sometimes we've utilized clipping um, that pyloric suture. We, we kind of clip it into place so that we can prevent the catheter from falling out. Um, and finally, uh, troubleshooting the interduodenal manometry equipment. So I stress that it's really important for, um, you know, whatever professional is using this equipment, be very familiar with it. Um, for example, ours is 24, uh, a 24 channel catheter. So that's 24 channels that we need to keep an eye on to make sure everything's going um, according to plan and that we're getting that high quality tracing. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about endoflip. So this is a photo of an endoflip balloon on the right. <clears throat> um, there are two different types of catheters. There's a 16 centimeter catheter and an eight centimeter catheter. For um, pyloric endoflip, we use the eight centimeter catheter because it's easier um, for placement. Um, and also those uh, impedance sensors are closer together. So we get a really good look at the pylorus. Um, so there's 16 impedance sensors, one every half centimeter and one balloon pressure sensor. So each impedance sensor measures voltage. Um, the endoflip catheter measures cross-sectional area and balloon pressure. Uh, those two values give us our distensibility index, which is the cross-sectional area over the balloon pressure and the diameter. And those are what we use to determine if um, the pylorus or the, if the tracing is normal or abnormal. So here's our endoflip protocol for gastroparesis. Um, we inflate the eight centimeter balloon to 30, 40, and 50 mLs. And it's really important to hold it for at, for at least one minute at each volume. Um, this is because we see a lot of movement in the stomach sometimes. So um, for one, it allows the balloon to kind of uh, level out for the fluid to um, equally disperse throughout the balloon. But it also helps us to see past the artifact that is sometimes caused by motility in the stomach. Um, a diameter less than 12 millimeters or a distensibility index of less than 10 millimeters squared per millimeters of mercury is considered abnormal. Uh, this information can help the clinician decide if therapies to open the pylorus should be performed. So here on the right is our endoflip tracing of the pylorus. The top or blue part of the tracing is the antrum, and the bottom is the duodenum. The waste you see in the middle, that is the pylorus. So you can see on this tracing, or actually for this specific patient, we actually had a lot of duodenal activity, which I always find pretty interesting. But again, these tracings can vary from patient to patient. Um, so here we can see actually, um, uh, what it looks like to do endoflip in the pylorus. Before I start the video, I'll just point out, we can see a um, suture on the proximal end of the balloon and our endoscopist, who's actually Dr. Hassler, is holding on to that suture. That helps to keep the balloon in place um, when we see that motility. Here. So you can actually see a little bit of movement in the antrum <clears throat> as the balloon is inflating and it propagates through to the, through the pylorus. You can see that suture really helps stabilize it in place. Otherwise it would have gotten sucked right into the duodenum. So now we can talk about um, different treatments of gastroparesis. One treatment is uh, dietary changes. And gastroparesis patients frequently follow a low residue diet. 
<clears throat> so what that means is we want to keep it pretty low in fiber. So making sure to take the skins off of fruits and vegetables, avoiding uh, fruits or vegetables with seeds in them. Um, also uh, cooking fruits and vegetables and avoiding eating them raw. Um, we can do medication, so prokinetics, antispasmatics, or antiemetics. Prokinetics will promote the motility um, and antispasmatics and antiemetics will help treat some of the symptoms of gastroparesis, so abdominal, abdominal pain or nausea and vomiting. There's also endoscopic and surgical treatments. Uh, some endoscopic treatments are pyloric botulinum toxin injection or gastric per oral endoscopic myotomy or GPOM. There's also surgical uh, treatment, in, which is a pyloroplasty. Start with pyloric botulinum toxin injection. Um, as an allied health professional in the motility world, um, working in the physiology lab, I don't see the um, dietary change or medication part of treatment. I do see a lot of the endoscopic uh, treatment. So that's what we'll talk about. Um, our institution uses 200 units of botulinum toxin uh, that's injected in the pylorus during an upper, endos upper endoscopy. Just like we want botulinum toxin to relax the muscles on our face, re relax the wrinkles on our face, um, we want the botulinum toxin to relax the muscles of the pylorus. This will increase the opening to the duodenum and make it easier for food to pass through the stomach. We also have used endoflip to measure changes in pyloric diameter and distensibility after botulinum toxin injection. This is one of the endoflip tracings of a patient before and after botulinum toxin injection, you can see that it actually looks a little tighter or a little less stretchy after, uh, after injection. And we think that's mostly artifactual. We think it's that fluid uh, that we just injection that, that we just inject, injected that's causing it to look tighter, not that the muscle itself is actually tighter. Um, typically, patients feel peak symptom improvement about six weeks after injection. For some patients, the relief can last a long time. Other patients get repeated injections as often as every three to six months. Next, we'll talk about GPOM. Uh, GPOM is an emerging therapy for gastroparesis that involves making one or two myotomies of the pylorus via a submucosal tunnel. The goal is to increase the opening of the pylorus to allow food to pass more easily into the small intestine. So very similar to what we're doing, what we hope to do with botulinum toxin injection. However, a, a GPOM is a more permanent solution as opposed to the botulinum toxin injection. Uh, we also use endoflip to measure changes in pyloric diameter and distensibility after GPOM. So this is a video of our endoscopist performing the myotomy portion of the GPOM. So the submucosal tunnel has already been made. And you can see uh, as he starts to cut through the pyloric muscle here. And as I mentioned earlier, this can be uh, done using one myotomy or there can be a double myotomy G palm. Here on the left, you see the myotomy uh, just straight down the center of the photo. And on the right, we have the double myotomy. There's one myotomy on the left uh, and one myotomy on the right. We actually have done uh, data analysis and found that Double myotomy can increase the opening of the pylorus more than a single myotomy, 
without impairing its ability to close, which is also very important. Um, keep in mind, our analysis was done on a small, very small sample size, um, but we still felt that this was an interesting finding. And this is the endo flip um, before and after GPOM. Unlike what I mentioned during the uh, botulinum toxin injection, we do see, um, we do hope to see immediate improvement on endo flip after uh, gastric for oral endoscopic myotomy. So it's tough to see the numbers, but on the left, our diameter went from 11.3 um, to in a desensibility of 5.23. Uh, and after GPOM, we had a diameter of, I believe, about 13 and a distensibility of 9.23. So the diameter did normalize and the distensibility was very close to normalizing. It was just under that um, 10 millimeters squared per millimeters of mercury mark. Um, we found endoflip to be very useful during gastric for oral endoscopic myotomy because if we don't see that immediate improvement that we're hoping for, um, it can prompt the endoscopist to just go back in and take a second look, see if there's anything else to cut, see if any muscle was missed. So it has been a very useful tool for this procedure. Um, and I'll the last slide I have is just really encouraging a strong collaboration between uh, allied health professionals and physicians because it can really create strong programs that can uh, better serve patients. Um, the example I have here is the Endoflip program at University of Michigan. When I started in 2018, for that fiscal year, they did 21 total Endoflip cases. Um, and that was mostly esophageal diagnostic studies done in the procedure unit. Um, and then in fiscal year 19, we did 121 total cases. So we had moved from the um, thoracic, or we had moved to the thoracic surgery OR and um, to the pediatric endoscopy suites. So, and that just happened because a physician would send an email and say, hey, I heard you guys have this interesting tool. Do you mind if I give it a try? So a strong partnership with those physicians can really help create strong programs. We've published a lot of data. We're able to serve a lot of patients um, just through that teamwork. A um, hundred cases might not seem like a lot, but in a small lab of three people, it's quite a bit. So it's something I uh, am really proud of with our team at University of Michigan. And I encourage everyone to, you know, however they want to grow things, just partner with each other. Um, again, thank you to uh, Dr. Baker, Dr. Hassler, Dr. Pandolfino, and ANMS for allowing me to speak today. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Excellent job. Um, well done. Um, we got, remember uh, for the people who are attending, if you could put the questions in the Q&A box um, and we'll, we'll try to get to all the questions um, um, placed in there. Um, and then uh, we'll kind of toggle back and forth between Dr. Hasser, Lydia and myself. Um, and then um, we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. Yep, Jason, Dr. Jason I just want to, uh echo what uh, Lydia said from the physician standpoint. It, it really is a partnership and a collaboration. And, and I've had really excellent uh, interactions with all the allied uh, personnel at Michigan, both Jason for more than 20 years and Lydia for the last four or five years uh, before I moved. And, and really it's very much a team effort and, and uh, having a, a, a good, collaboration really is beneficial for the patient. And I'm very, very uh, supportive and, and I'm excited that there are nearly 200 participants on this, uh, on this teleconference who I assume mostly are allied personnel. Is that true, Jason? Um, there's, there's a hand, most of them seem to be allied, in the allied health field, the proceduralists, and there's also, um, we're blessed to have several physicians attending today too. Good, all right. So how do you wanna handle the questions, Jay? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the first one and we can kind of just go back and forth a little bit. Um, you know, just toggling off what Dr. Hasser said, and before we get into the technical questions, um, Lydia, I, I, just for all the proceduralists and allied health people listening today, um, you know, the collaboration and partnership, but if you could give like one or two like pearls of wisdom, how would they start that conversation with their with their part, physician partner at their local institution? If they want to start developing a pyloric program for gastroparesis or any type of program, um, in liaison with the GI physiology lab? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I've actually, you know, come to Dr. Hassler, or Dr. Law um, many times just when I saw something like this, not to plug our own uh, webinar here, but, you know, if I came across a new study or saw a webinar like this and said, hey, did you guys see this? Um, is this something that we could do here? I thought it was really interesting. So that's typically how I would start the conversation through, you know, if someone had done it before or um, I thought it was similar to what we were doing and maybe they were doing it in a better, more robust way. Um, just kind of opening up that line of communication. Yeah, I would, I would just echo similar things. You know, I would, for all the procedural sound and call, if you, if you attend a AMS meeting, you see something interesting or you just see an interesting finding or if you see something interesting on Google from a technology, definitely knock on a door because you never know where that relationship will go. Um, that's kind of how I started. And then um, I think we follow a little same track, knocking on a door and, you know, opportunities come, come with that knock more often than not. Um, so, Dr. Hasser, you want to read the first one about the uh, antidote yeah. so I'll, I'll pass this off to uh, Lydia, and I'll uh, follow up with the answer to this if, if she wants me to. Uh, uh, from an anonymous attendee, do you have any problems taking the antiduodenal manometry catheter out after clipping at the pylorus? We have not had any problems. Um, we just... Uh, make sure that the patient is sitting upright and kind of have their chin tucked down towards their chest and um, do a quick tug to release the clip um, and then pull the catheter out in one sweeping motion. Um, we have Dr. Hassler, or we've had Dr. Hassler present because he was the one that did them with us, but um, we have a physician present um, when we're doing that, but we have not had any adverse events. Yeah, and, and just to add on, I, I do have, as I'm pulling the catheter out, have the patient go through a very slow and deliberate exhalation so as to not uh, be tempted to inhale in if the clip were to fall off, but that's never happened. Um, I'll start with ask you, and Dr. Hester may add some comments, this, but Dr. Parkman asks, how is the endoflip catheter passed into the pylorus if there's a biopsy force up in the biopsy channel? Yep, so we actually don't ever put um, the endoflip down through the um, biopsy channel. It's too, or we don't use the really, we don't use the bigger scopes that could fit that. So we pass the catheter down into the stomach first, um, and then the scope will be passed. Um, sometimes I've gotten lucky and can get it through the pylorus in one swoop, but um, free, most of the time the endoscopist will, once they follow down, they'll grab onto one of the sutures with that biopsy force up and uh, take the catheter down alongside it, um, not in it, if that makes sense. All right, another question from Dr. I agree with everything Lydia said. Another question from Dr. Parkman. Is the stomach decompressed to assess pyloric endoflip readings? We de decompress it as much as we can. Um, you know, we still have to keep it visualized so we can make sure that the um, we can make sure that it's in place that it's placed properly. Um, but we do make a point to decompress it as much as we can. Yeah, I, I'll add on to that. And and Henry, that's a really good question. I would say that. Uh, Although we haven't looked at our own data, we've talked about it. Um, you know, there is the concern that if you have a massively distended stomach, you'll cause a reflex contraction of the pylorus. Uh, the other uh, question you might ask, which is related, is if you put 
too big of a loop uh, into the along the greater curvature of the stomach, are you going to influence the end of flip recording? So um, when I've done this, I try and have as little pressure or tension on the uh, distal stomach when we're recording. All right, so we'll do the next question. Can you talk through what tools you use to administer pyloric Botox? That's probably a better question for me, seeing as how <laughs> or, or the physicians. I mean, we use just a standard uh, uh, injection catheter and uh, we, I, I'm now at my second institution where we've been doing Botox. And, and I know that when I did it at Michigan, we would dissolve the Botox in a concentration of 25 units per ml and do a series of eight injections, approximately eight millimeters out from the, out, from the inner uh, margin of the pylorus. Um, I know that some of the clinicians where I, are, I am nowadays uh, believe that Botox causes scarring and they do uh, concentrations of 50 or even 100 ml, 100 units per uh, ml. So uh, I, I would say it's inconsistent from center to center. And uh, uh, what, what billing code do you use for endoflip for pylorus? And probably the indication too. You no, know, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Do you know it? It's the Barristat code still, right? Is that the one you use? Pretty sure. It's like 910, I thought, yeah. Yeah, I'll get that, uh, let me get that. And then I may add this, uh, um, could you, um, could, this is from uh, Samara Harris. Could you comment on the validity of the liquid phase gastric emptying study? I'm not sure Dr. Hassel wants to take that one or? Yeah, sure, that's, that's, that's an extremely controversial topic and a really good question. Uh, you know, the, the, the liquid phase test was actually best described by the uh, Temple University group in Philadelphia several years ago. And, and they actually looked at what sort of additional yield you got from liquid phase testing above and beyond uh, what you got uh, from a solid phase scan. And, and I believe they saw that it was somewhere in the range of an additional 20 to 25% of patients who ended up having a positive scan. So it will increase the yield. I know that the uh, gastroparesis consortium looked at this a little bit and came up with uh, findings which suggested that there is a subset of patients who have only liquid delays and don't have solid delays. And, and I've always been asked by my colleagues, how do I manage those? I manage those just like I manage a gastroparesis patient. So I think adding liquid uh, improves the yield uh, or the detection rate of, of delays. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Partman, it was CPT code 91046. So the next question is by Joy Liu. Can you place the flip catheter through a G-tube tract when present, or would this all uh, affect the reading? I mean, I've, I've never done that. Um, I, I think it would be probably pretty difficult to place depending on where it was, but I've never done it that way. I guess I'll add on to that. It, it would, I think I, I agree with everything Lydia just said. It would, I think, cause almost like a right-hand turn to do it. Um, but since you, since at least when we did it, um, we always had an endoscope present. Um, we figured it's kind of a straighter shot to go down the, um, um, go down the esophagus and have kind of a smooth curve to the uh, endoflip catheter as opposed to uh, 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 a right-hand turn. Um, kind of along those same lines, Joy, I don't know if you would be thinking about this. The, the question is, is, is do we do endoflips in people who have GJ tubes, for example? And I know we were asked to do this several times at uh, Michigan. And, uh, and um, although you might think it would be uh, technically difficult. It turns out it wasn't all that hard. And in fact, we got what we thought was pretty reasonable uh, results when we did it. We got very similar results with a GJ tube in place as opposed to uh, just a native uh, recording. Mm -hmm. um, the next one from uh, Peter Mavrellis. Um, uh, Lydia, can the same endoflip catheter be used on the same patient several times? 
Yeah, so we do, we do use the same catheter like during intraoperative when we do pre and post intervention, we use the same catheter. Um, okay, and then a couple of these next ones are more management approach things. So I'll go over these. I'll give quick answers, although um, I believe I'm told this is gastroparesis month and there is actually another uh, clinical management webinar next week. I believe Dr. Lacey from uh, the East Coast uh, Mayo Clinic is, is giving that. Um, so by Artemis, uh, what is my stepwise approach to medications in a patient with gastroparesis? I would say, yes, a prokinetic is, is the first choice. And uh, because of its cost and availability, we still use a fair amount of metoclopramide. Um, obviously, we do use a broad range of antiemetics and neuromodulators, for example, mirtazapine. Um, and uh, in patients who fail all those, we do uh, refer to non-medication options, including pyloric therapies, as Lydia has described, or even gastric stimulation. Yeah, I think the next one is a little bit on the technical side. Maybe Dr. Hassey can provide some um, clinical measure if it impacts it. But uh, uh, Ki Wook Jung wrote, not like the esophageal endoflip. Endoflip along the pyloric ring can be a, a, affected by the angulation of the duodenum. How can we guarantee that the DI value from the endoflip along the pyloric ring? Um, um, yeah, Jason, I, I, uh, Ki Wook, I think that's really a, a very perceptive and excellent question. Uh, the, I, I think the way we kind of exclude whether the distensibility values are being influenced by something other than the pylorus is by looking at the shape of the endoflip profile. And if you just see a standard girdle or hourglass type appearance, and you see kind of a wide diameter uh, tracing from the more distal uh, uh, sensors in the duodenum, then I think you probably don't have a problem with, with the uh, duodenum. Uh, it, it's a good question because I know there were a handful of endoflip recordings, which we've done, where you see sort of a secondary pinch uh, further on down in the duodenum. And, and I would suspect in those instances, then you're starting to see influenced by factors other than the pylorus and some of the readings you get. Um. I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, if you have the screen or the end of flip 2.0, not just the um, not just the main module. Um, on the main module, it just does the most narrow point, and those are the readings you get. On the screen, you get the diameter and distensibility readings at each impedance sensor. So if you do have, you know, multiple ways where you think. Um, where maybe it's looking like the narrow, um, the most narrow point is like distal to the first way. So you're thinking it might be some sort of like turn in the duodenum or something. You can still look at the screen and get the diameter and the distensibility for what, um, for the sensor you think the pylorus is at. Excellent, excellent. Well, we have a, we have a, we got through pretty good this, this presentation series. We got through about 50% of the questions. But uh, the time is coming to an end, and um, the rest of the questions um, uh, will be posted on Doc Matters, and Dr. Hess will say a few things about that. And then um, um, we're blessed that we have another couple presentations coming up this year, and we hope everybody will attend those. Dr. Hess? Yes, thank you, uh, Jason. I want to thank all the participants and all the uh, attendees. I, I think that this was a, a really nice. Uh, uh, introduction, especially for the allied uh, health professional perspective. Um, and again, there'll be another uh, uh, webcam uh, um, talk next week to uh, go over other aspects of this disease. Um, there is a, what's it called, Doc Matter, is that right, uh, Jason? Yeah, yeah Doc Matters, yep. Yeah. People yeah. can uh, put their questions on, and Jason and I, I believe we're responsible to answer that in two to three days, is that uh, correct? That's correct. We can have the, Doc Matters can host a, uh, additional conversations and um, um, and just continue the conversation going, especially during gastroparesis awareness month. Very good. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.